The second principle that gets applied here is one of risk identification. So again, if you've, you've got a very complicated problem and you break it down to its component parts, there are going to be things that are very easy to do. There are going to be things that are hard to do. Um, we, are, we are trained to go after the things that are harder to do first. We want to tackle the riskiest parts first because the easy stuff is stuff we can always do and we know we can do it. So if, you have a, if, you have a, if you're a project manager or have, have been in a complicated project, we are always looking for identifying what's riskiest and tackling those first. And that same principle gets applied here. Is we want to identify what's riskiest in a startup and what's particularly riskiest on that business model and start with that. Okay. And, um, and so I would say that, that for, for a startup, um, it, it basically boils down to risk mitigation. If you're, if you're trying to get funding, for example, um, if you have a hockey stick curve where you're, you have early traction or you have got a lot of traction, f finding funding is usually not a problem. It's more a question of finding the right investor. You can show them that curve and don't need much of a pitch, don't need much of a business model to even put in front of them. Um, and you probably would get funding because you've actually de-risked a lot of your startup already. Now, if you don't quite have that, then the investors go into the exercise of de-risking their investment for you. So they're not in the business because they like the problem you're solving or they like the solution specifically. You know, those things all help if you can get synergies with investors that, that appreciate those. But the real reason they're, they're investing in you is because they're in the money-making business. They want to find a business model that works. And they're going to find ways to de-risk your startup at that point. So if you don't have traction, which is usually the... The, um, the, 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 the code for, for, for a company that's on its path to working. They're going to look at other proxies like your team, your experience, um, all these other things that, that go into de-risking what you're trying to do. Similarly, when we are trying to sell to customers, as I mentioned before, customers are bombarded with all kinds of options. We have to de-risk our products to them. You know, why us versus the competitor? Why us against, maybe not, it's not even a, a ready competitor, but it's an alternative. They might, they might be using something that we didn't think was a competitor, but why us versus them? And so we're always looking to de-risk. And so the job of the entrepreneur really becomes a case of systematically de-risking your startup from that initial idea to eventually getting something to work. And so I mentioned this already, but this is the principle that we apply here, is looking at the canvas and identifying what's riskiest. Now, sometimes that can be technology risk. As I mentioned, you're searching for the cure of cancer or you've got, you're building the next um, big search algorithm and it's built on all this research and that is the hard thing you want to go solve first, then by all means, you know, that's a, that's a risk you have to mitigate first before you have the chance of building anything else around it. But for the majority of us, we are not plagued with technology risk. So for anyone that's building software and even hardware today, I'm yet to find someone that's really like trying to build this really complicated software that can't be done, you know, because it's so, it's so risky. So with the advent of the internet, cloud computing, uh, open source, we can build software at a, at a much faster pace than ever before. And we're actually doing it in startup weekends and hackathons. We're doing that every week all around the world. We're actually building more stuff than ever before. Unfortunately, the, the odds of success haven't gone up. So all of those products are just going down the drain because they're not really tackling any real problems that customers um, either have or, or, or need. Um, so for me, that is, that's, that's, that's where um, it's, it's, it's way more important to identify what's risky and if it ends up being customers and problems, starting with those places uh, first. So what's riskiest about the startup actually evolves and it changes as the startup goes through to its life cycle. And so I like to share kind of the three stages that I, I kind of see startups going through. And as we get more into the, the slides later on, we'll see how even the risk morphs from the earliest stages to, 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 to the um, latter stages. So every startup starts out in this initial stage where there's an idea or an inkling. And when I say startup, I'm not necessarily meaning your typical startup. This could be a, a, a product in a big company, but any new product starts with this initial inkling of an idea and problem solution of what it is we want to go do. <coughs> the first thing we want to do is, is hit this problem solution fit stage. So the question we're trying to ask there is, do I even have a problem worth solving? Um, and the way that we do that in the lean startup world is really decouple the problem from the solution. What we're trying to do is first, is, is first go and validate or test if the customers we think we want to build this product for actually recognize they have a problem in the first place. So we, we separate the solution that we're trying to do and just talk about problems. And we do this through a problem interview. And there's a whole script and a process for doing it. But we go in there and we test our problems with them and see if they know they have this problem. 
uh, in the first place. And if they do, the second thing that's very important is we want to understand uh, is how they're actually solving these problems today. So many people, and I'll show you a case study where I fell into the same trap, think we know who the competition is, but only through those interviews do we actually uncover from how they're solving problems, we actually uncover who the true competition ends up, ends up being. So people that, you, people that might be having um, you know, the, 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 the uh, best press or, or touting kind of the best features are, are still oblivious to these, to these customers. And so it's really very customer driven and you have to, you have to engage with customers to understand their world, world view. Um, from, that, from those initial set of interviews, once we, once we can understand how customers work and their worldview, we, we actually arm ourselves with the information we need to then go back and build the best possible solution for them. And even there, we don't go away for weeks or months trying to build this solution out. We look for proxies, and we'll look at many examples here, but these could be things like screenshots or demos or even physical prototypes if you're building a physical pro uh, product. Anything that allows the customer to visualize the solution. So I mentioned early on how customers can articulate their problems. So in the problem interview, you might get them really excited and say, yes, I must have this, I must have this problem solved. What you want to do before going down the path of building it is to put something in front of them to say, uh, kind of close the dot and, or, or yeah, basically close the loop and make sure that what it is that you're going to build will actually service their needs. And that's also a great time to test pricing, as I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later, because I feel pricing and product go very hand in hand. So that's when you really achieve problem solution fit, is when you have found problems that are worth solving. And when you have the beginnings of a, of a spec or a minimum viable product definition, as we call in the lean startup, of what it is that you need to go build, then we go away and we actually build that minimum viable product. And so the process here is really maximizing your odds right there to build something that a customer will potentially pay for because they've given you that verbal commitment and maybe even prepaid for, for what you're going to build because it, it kind of strikes a chord with them. So you go away, again, not for, for weeks or months or years, but hopefully, well, hopefully it's weeks and not months or years because you have reduced the scope. You've actually defined it down to that <coughs> minimum uh, viable product. So it's the minimum feature set that you would need to launch your initial version of this product. Not the complete product, but just the initial version to start this conversation of learning with customers. We then go through the launch process. We put that out there, and then that's where the second type of conversation begins. So here, what we're doing is really measuring what customers say. We're trying to understand their worldview. We're actually talking to different types of customers, trying to prioritize customers, build our typical um, archety archetype or prototype of, of an ideal early adopter. And then in the second stage, we're really targeting those early adopters and starting the process of iteration and building that minimum viable product which begins to measure what customers do with it. So a lot of people say they'll pay your products. In inadvertently, you'll find people lie at this stage where they tell you they're going to pay for something and when the time comes, they don't because either the, quali either, either the product didn't deliver on the value or they just lied to you up front. And so there are some, some techniques for, for trying to figure out if they, if they do lie or not. Um, and so a great, a great way to, to measure that is, um, so I would say that even in this state, I'll, I'll kind of throw that tactic out here right now but usually in the problem, problem interview stage, a lot of people go and ask customers, do you think this problem is, is worthy solving? And a lot of them will say, yes, of course, they're just being polite. Um, the, the real test is really asking them how they're solving it today. And so if you find a customer that's really doing nothing, they're just getting by, this is a, this is a problem they want solved, but they aren't doing anything and they're getting by, then it's probably a, must, a, a nice to have problem for them and maybe even a don't need. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. But if you find them doing, um, kind of very active things. They're actually using a competitor's product or they're building a homegrown system and not happy with either of those solutions, then there's a very good chance that you could build something that's better than those uh, products and may have a chance of, of replacing those alternatives for them. So that's a way of, of really measuring that must have thing I talked about because that's something a lot of people say, well, you know, customers will always tell me it's a must have, but how do I know it really is? And I go and build this product and they don't buy it. So that's a way to do it. And then even at the pricing points, there are ways to like get commitments. So that's something I've been doing lately with my own products is that before I would be happy with just the verbal commitments, but now I actually want like more deeper commitments to where you either prepay for this or, uh, or, you, or you buy now or you, or you do a partial payment. Of course, we're gonna back it up with a guarantee where if it doesn't work, we'd be happy to, to give you your money back, but you, you're still putting some skin in the game. So there's this, there's this, um, there's this common, uh, kind of theme in with products is that uh, you know one of uh, one one of lowering sign up friction 
And so as entrepreneurs, we always want to lower the barriers for using our stuff because we think if, we, if only we had the opportunity to put our products in front of customers, they'll fall in love with it and they'll happily pay for it. And while that happens down the road, right now your product is probably going to be like very buggy. It's, it's going to suck. It's not going to be that good. And so what we really want to do is really identify who the early adopters are who are almost as visionary as us to be able to see where the product is going and are willing to work with us through that process. And so it's a very careful selection process there. Next yeah, question. Uh, there's this theory out there about building something for yourself. Yeah. So I think it's a great hack um, to, to, to actually use. So it's the scratch your own itch. And like the 37 single guys also, like they swear by that and say that they only build stuff for themselves. And I think it's a great hack because it gives you that initial advantage of understanding the problem. So the only problems that I have with that is that, one, it's hard to be objective with yourself. So you can always convince yourself that this problem is worth solving because I want to solve it for me. Um, and then the second thing with it is also hard to be objective with things like pricing, like what would you really pay yourself and how can you say that's an objective assessment. So I do think it's a great advantage to have, and, I, and if you'll see like what I'm doing, uh, even my first company started out with scratching my own itch and even what I'm doing now is really building products for other entrepreneurs and I'm an entrepreneur so I use my own products every day. So I think it's a great advantage because you immerse yourself in the problems and the solutions. But what I will say is that it's not an excuse or a shortcut to get out of the interview process. Because even if I look at that example, um, even though I'm building stuff for entrepreneurs, I don't find anyone else in the room that's building those kinds of products because they're not, they're not, they're not interested in those products. And if I want to sell this to other types of entrepreneurs or other people in general, um, it, I'm, already, I'm already disqualifying myself because I'm actually doing something about it. I'm taking the problem and building a solution. Most other people aren't. So I have to go out and really validate if these are real problems for them too and will they pay for them. So there, it's not really an excuse to not go out and, and do this, this interviewing process. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. So, so when you say it, so I, I would say with the first thing, if it doesn't quite meet um, all their needs, so you're saying it doesn't have all the features they want to be able to con com consider it complete, or, or anything oh, it doesn't exist. Well, if it doesn't exist, that's that's great because what we're really doing here is is spending a, you know, is actually being a little bit more creative up front. Like we're really trying to get down to root problems and then formulate some solutions. Now, at some point, you would have to put a technical feasibility hat, because if you, if you kind of let yourself go too loose over here, you might be building a rocket ship to, to, to Mars, and it would be really impossible to actually realize. So there is that discipline where you have to figure out what it is that you can achieve. But what we're really trying to do is hone in on what are the top one to two problems that we should do. And you will see a, 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 an example of that later on where it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a complete product, where it doesn't have to have all 100 features that the fully baked product will have, but you're trying to hone in on what is that must-have problem and how can I solve that one problem right now, right today, and, and validate that that's what the, the customer will want and will pay for. So we're trying to get to that, and then as far as it not being built, you're actually being very honest up here. You're actually, this is more of an, in some ways, a discovery, and it's called customer discovery for exactly that reason is we're really trying to discover whether this is a problem worth solving. And it's perfectly fine to be upfront that this doesn't exist yet, but this is what we want to do. And if we build this, you know, would you, would, are you committed to, to, um, to purchasing this or to using this? So that's why I said in this stage, we're actually more, like realistically, what we get out of here are verbal commitments, and we're measuring what customers say. But we don't want to spend a whole lot of time, like one can spend a lot of time here just doing you know, quote unquote research or just doing interviews like to no end. But we want to time box that and really move to that next stage where we do have an inclination, a much more informed guess on who the, on who the early adopter would be, what that short list of problems are they want solved and what that short list of features are we need to build. We go and build it and then we start that uh, process from there. So once, any, any other questions? Yeah. In your own experience, were you actually able to get a prepayment on a feature that doesn't exist? On a feature that doesn't exist? Yeah, like, hey, you want to do this? Mm -hmm. If you pay us 50 bucks, we'll guarantee that we'll get it done by so or something like that. Were you actually able to? Yes. Really? Yes. 
So again, so I, I, and I talk about this a lot, is that you know, part of the interviewing process is, 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 is trying to figure out that unique value proposition. And so I, I talk about this a little bit later too, but so, so one question I get a lot is how do you even find people to interview and how do you even find, like you're, you're asking a more latter question, how do you even get them to pay? But I would say even the interview questions, if you get to a point where you can nail a, a customer's problem, um, if, I go to a, if I go to a business and I can tell them, I, I just leave a, a voicemail to them and tell them I have a way for them to double their business and you know, not be that you know, scammy sounding, but actually have a real like, compelling proposition that's actually that good, um, they would return my call. They would return a cold call because everyone wants to be, to be more successful with their products. So if you can really nail a customer problem, um, they, are, they would, and that's a test of an early adopter, is that usually you know, in these interviews, you are the one that's most passionate about what it is you're building. But if you nail the problem, <laughs> things switch, and I've seen that happen with some of my products where the customers actually become as passionate as me and sometimes even more passionate than me, and they want the product right now. And when they want it right now, they are actually willing to pull out their checkbook and pay for it right now, and I can take their money right now. So it, it, I've, I've been in situations where, where I've, done, you know, I've, I've done that. Um, but it is, it is not going to happen overnight, so it's not going to be your first interview. But through that process of, of figuring out their pains, you can, you can get to a point where there are certain words that you use and it actually instills that kind of a feeling. And that's an example of a must-have, too, is when you do see, so I talked about the testing it with how they solve the problem, but also their, their body language and their excitement about the problems are, are, are ways to gauge whether they, this is really a must-have problem or not. <coughs> So if you, have to, if you have to sell, and, that, and that's a good kind of segue too, is if you have to sell or convince somebody to use your MVP, then they most likely are not uh, an early adopter. So in my more recent products that I've done, I've really just shown them like screenshots, and I've had people willing to pay for it, like even, even prepay for it to just get in line to use the product. <clears throat> but once you actually go build it, that's when the rubber hits the road. That's when the real test starts. Because everything here, in some ways, it's easier to do because you're just making promises. Um, and you're just talking about problems. But you have to then go back and really build the stuff and make sure that what you build actually does work. So what we're trying to do in that product market fit stage is measure whether we have built something that people want. And again, there are, there are qualitative and quantitative metrics to do that. And we can talk a little bit about that later on. But the idea there is that you get enough people using your product, and if you're charging, they're also paying for your product to where some level of success is guaranteed. You're getting some cash flow, or you're getting some usage out of your product, and people are happily using it. They're giving you positive testimonials. You're on an upward trend. Um, at that point, the focus shifts more towards scaling. So once you have something that's starting to work, that's when you, you, you kind of double down and then look at ways to grow the business model, ways to increase, as Eric likes to call them, you know, figure out what the, the drivers of your engine of growth are and really tune them to where you can accelerate the business plan, the business model, and really make this thing scale and achieve the goals that you had set out in the, in the first place. So I would say the product market fit stage is a very significant milestone for a startup. And it really even defines the startup, both in terms of the strategies they use as well as the tactics they employ. And so it's a very good way to even divide this stage into just two stages, before and after product market fit. So before product market fit, our goal really as entrepreneurs is learning. We're trying to learn and we're trying to find what is that initial um, plan that's actually starting to work. So it's not going to be the initial plan, but what, 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 is, what is the iteration of that plan that's starting to work? Once we get to that stage, once we find a plan that's starting to work, we then shift into the second gear, which is accelerating that plan and making that plan kind of grow to a point where, again, it achieves our goals. And so this, this initial phase, unfortunately, ends up being very qualitative because we don't have a lot of customers. You know, we don't have um, a lot of users using our system. So we can do a lot of very complicated, uh, I wouldn't say complicated, but, but uh, things like quantitative tests, you know, split tests and things you hear about, like Google running 256 page tests, uh, c sorry, color, color tests on their website. You know, things like that are out of reach because you won't, you won't have enough traffic to, to do those kinds of things. So, so this terrain ends up being a lot more qualitative. And I often get a question of how do you really get to anything statistically significant by just talking to a handful of people? And the answer to that is that when you're initially starting out, a startup is really about building something that's bold and new. And when you initially start out, you'll be hard pressed to find people that fall into that category that I described where they actually pay attention to what you say. Most of them are not interested and don't quite react the way that I described. And so if you, if you go and present your idea to even 10 people, 
and all 10 of them say they wouldn't buy your product, that's pretty significant. If you can't even get 10 people in a direct conversation where you have 20, 30 minutes to talk about your product, uh, not be convinced, there's no way you can do that on a landing page. There's no way you can do that any other way. Um, so that's an exercise that's also great in being able to articulate what it is about your product that is compelling and, and get customers to buy. So qualitative is, is not a guarantee that you will build a, a hugely successful, a highly scalable business, but it gives you permission to move forward to that next level. If you can even get 10 people that say they'll buy your product, it gives you permission to go and build that MVP and then see if you can make that 10 turn into 100, maybe 1,000, maybe 10,000, depending on, again, what, what kind of product it is, what kind of price points you're talking about. Um, so that's where the qualitative kind of comes in. And then once you get into more scale, then we are really um, kind of the, 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 the scale tips where we're doing more quantitative experiments. Then the focus turns more into optimization. So we do things like, for those that are um, kind of uh, familiar with like landing page tests, we, we actually start optimizing for, for conversions on the landing page. So, so we, we start making little changes like um, colors of buttons. We might start playing around with words. We might start playing around with graphics and positioning of things. But we're looking for those small improvements. Even if we, when you have a million people hitting your site, if you can even get a 1% Im improvement in your conversion, that is huge for your business. At this point, it's irrelevant. If you get 10 people hitting your site, a 1% improvement is not that big of, a, of an improvement. And so it's not worth all the effort. So in, in this stage, the kind of experiments we run are more pivots. So they are more bold you know, sweeps of, ex of, of experiments. So rather than changing the color of a button on a landing page, I would recommend changing the entire landing page. You know, changing like the color scheme, maybe the value proposition, the graphics, and I'll show you some examples of, of what some of those early landing pages might even look like.